Welcome to BCN's new series, What's Happening Now, a collection of informational and hopefully entertaining programming where we speak substantively to interesting and important people. I'm going to let that stand. Today is no exception. Today we get to speak with Beaufort County Schools Superintendent Matthew Cheeseman, and he's in a bit of a pickle right now dealing with the state of North Carolina, the coronavirus, COVID-19, whichever way you want to refer to it. Mm -hmm. And he has a difficult position of dealing with all these problems. And what I've done today is put a collection of questions together, and he's graciously allowed himself some time to come meet with us and the public at large, because all of you will see this. And he will answer these questions and hopefully inform everyone as to what the best management practice for Beaufort County Schools will be going forward through this year in the age of COVID. Thank you for being here today. Well, thank you very much for having me. This is great. This is great. Absolutely. You're so good at speaking. I feel honored <laughs> to have you here. The other day I was sitting and having lunch, early breakfast, I think, and I turned it over to Fox News and um, I said, oh my gosh, hey, Lynn, there's Cheeseman on TV, and you hadn't right. started speaking yet. That's right. John Roberts was speaking, and if sure. you, you people don't know who John Roberts is, he normally asks questions of the President of the United States. Today, he was asking questions <laughs> of our superintendent, Matthew Cheeseman. That was a lot of fun. And you did great. Oh, thank you. And he tried to knock you off a message, and you stuck right to that message. Well, what was interesting about that is the, the day before I received an email that was directed straight to me inviting me for that opportunity. But I also know that they invited many other superintendents, other people in the state. Um, but I just found myself wanting to brag about Beaufort County Schools teachers and TAs and what we're trying to do. And so I, I immediately responded to it. Uh, what I did not know is just what the dynamics would be. Um, but I'm just really thankful to uh, Ashley Fadgett and Paul Huggins, who are great teammates of mine to really set it up uh, on our side to make sure that we were able to communicate with New York uh, appropriately. But definitely a lot of fun speaking with John Roberts. And uh, you know, I understand that he has some very hard questions to ask, but always a great time to be able to celebrate our teachers, our students, and, and all of uh, both the county schools. Well, he gave you the entire segment between commercial and commercial. <laughs> That's a lot. And you did most yeah. of the talking because when he'd ask you a question, you almost filibustered and told him a different version of the same thing, and I you did, did great. Well, we want to keep that message. So we're extremely appreciative of our teachers and teacher assistants and really all of our staff, including our school nutrition team. I mean, to be able to do the type of work that we did in the spring of 2020 as the governor closed out our schools on Saturday, March 14th, and for us to be able to, to suddenly uh, feed students on that Monday, to be in remote learning on that Wednesday, uh, that is extraordinary. And our teachers did an amazing job of really transforming the way they were instructing students. And you know, not to be left out of that equation are the parents and the guardians and those who watch our students and, and care for those students. So it was just a, an amazing team effort. But you know, for the most part, anytime uh, John Roberts had a question for me. Uh, I wanted to make sure that Beaufort County understands just how much I appreciate uh, all of our employees for what they did, because that was certainly not an easy task. And, and quite frankly, um, you know, I, I understand that he has thoughts about uh, the politics of it and, and some of what goes on in that regard, but I just wanted to make sure our message was the same of how much we care for the people that we work with and work for. Um, you certainly got that message across. I'm not sure I'll be a guest again. <laughs> I really, I'm not sure I'll get another invitation. I mean, they, as soon as it ended, it was off very fast. So, oh, really? Oh, yes. Um, you know, as soon as he said thank you, they, he was gone. So he's, he's you know, gone to go think about what he's going to ask the president later the today. I'm, I'm sure. So, but it was a really great experience. And again, um, what I didn't really have a lot of forethought on is. The, the true recognition across the country, meaning we received a fair amount of emails just after that, and actually throughout the day, the next day, from people all over the country uh, praising our teachers, praising the service to kids, uh, asking questions of what our needs might be, uh, and then occasionally a few other questions as to you know, the, the dynamics of how school works. But it was just very nice to see that people took their time, reached out to us, and applauded our teachers and the teacher assistants who 
are not even from our own state just by seeing that interview. So with that, I was pretty excited about it. No, you did a fabulous job and you've done a great job in, in the last number of months that school mm -hmm. was in session, although from yeah. a distance perspective. Mm -hmm. um, I remember we talked that same day after the Sunday, I think it was a Saturday, it was Saturday, it was right? Saturday. It was a Saturday when he decided unilaterally to close the schools right. and you guys had to move quickly. I was there yes. at your meeting on Monday night yes. and I talked to you and I remember you referring that you'll do what you need to do, what you're yep. told to do, because at that yep. time everyone thought the governor had full authority to do what he, he right. did and he's still getting away with it, but that is the law, the rule of the land right now. I don't want to yep. call it a law, but it is the rule of the land right now. And I remember at that time you said, I don't know if closing is the right thing to do, but we'll do it anyway. Sure. And having that thought in your mind that closing might not have been the right objective, do you think it was the right thing or, or could have been, been done differently? Well, the Executive Order 117 is what guides us in the work that we do. And, and you know, for the governor, he had to make a decision that covered the entire state, whereas we're making decisions as superintendent and the Board of Education that govern Beaufort County. Um, and so specifically, you know, that announcement came at 4.30 on that Saturday. Uh, we received as superintendents about 45 minutes notice. Um, I was actually out in the yard, so I probably saw it 20 minutes before he was going about to be uh, announcing it. But in short, um, at that time I wasn't sure that closure for Beaufort County was most appropriate because the data, the science behind it showed me we had very little cases and at that time no active cases. And as you studied it moving through the spring, uh, we really were at a minimum. And Beaufort County just geographically was already spread out in terms of social distancing. And so I think that um, his decision to just shut it all down in the sense of not coming to the school building but still hosting school was a difficult decision. Um, but at the same time, you know, I think there are challenges in allowing each individual LEA, your local education agency, to try to operate in different ways and formats. So I can understand the decision, um, but I would have preferred to stay open for the rest of the year um, because at that time our COVID cases were at a, at a minimum. Well, well, we'll get back to that later in the conversation. Uh, I'm going to bury the lead, but I'm going to ask you this question. This is most important. A lot of parents are thinking about this, and we're getting a lot of mixed messages. Sure. Uh, I'm not a parent of a school-aged kid anymore, but I, you know, I have to understand and deal with what you guys do from my position as a county commissioner. Uh, when will school be opening? At one time, it was discussed it would be the 17th of August. Have you gotten another date in the last few days? So the Board of Education on Tuesday night uh, made a decision to opt with basically a modified plan B, and that plan is to attend school remotely for the first four weeks. So school officially starts for most of our population on August 17th, meaning by that time our students will have the devices they need to be in a remote setting, our employees will be in the building teaching and students will follow a typical schedule online as they would during a normal schedule at school. So as an example, if you were to have an 8 a.m. class, well, you're going to be online at 8 a.m. Uh, at home or wherever you may be. Now, the board also approved the early college high school to be under plan B without modification. So early college actually starts on August 5th, uh, but the remaining of the school district will be um, be on August 17th. And so the board will come back together before uh, that Friday, September 11th, to really weigh in on what the data is telling us and where we are to determine uh, whether students can come back into the buildings for the rest of the district starting September 14th. We have had an uptick in Booker County in cases. Mm -hmm. A lot of it could be the extra testing. Sure. But it is happening. Yes. I think today it was 226 confirmed cases, mm -hmm. 59 still active. Exactly. You know, Department of Public Instruction, uh, Department of Health and Human Services at the state level have really done a remarkable job of going back through their guidance of what's required versus what is recommended. Your local entities, such as your local health department, your local boards of education, 
they, I believe, are allowed to be more restrictive. They just can't be less restrictive. As an example, when the governor announced the idea of going plan A, B, or C, as the governor basically then came back most recently on July 14th and said you can either be plan B or plan C, you cannot go back least restrictive. So board, our board had the option of plan B or C, so they could be more restrictive. But in short, I think much of what's been provided to us uh, has been right on point in terms of the safety protocols, the social distancing, uh, the types of barriers that we're going to use, the protocols for transportation, the, the protocols for inter interacting inside of the building, deep cleaning, um, just in terms of how we get our resources. But I think uh, DPI, especially um, Deputy State Superintendents Bev Emery and uh, David Siegel have just been phenomenal in terms of helping both myself as a superintendent and all the superintendents across the state. They've been fantastic at listening, going back, learning, uh, rethinking, and then providing new guidance to us. So, in short, I do believe we're, we are receiving what we need. Uh, to continue that yeah. reference of what's been happening in this summer in preparing, yeah. uh, whether is there any hardware uh, installed within the schools to uh, block transmissions? Well, COVID-19 is something that you just cannot see. And, and very similarly, I mean, you can't see the flu. I, you're talking to a trained chemist, and I, I taught chemistry and forensic science for 14 years. And, and so when you're working with young adults inside the building and young students, you're in that scenario of chemistry and, and science, you're trying to teach them about something that they can't necessarily see, right? So I take that style of, of learning and, and the way I used to teach as an instructor, and now I'll flip it forward. So now we're looking at COVID-19, and how do we combat something that we can't see? And so we've really looked at the blueprints of all of our schools. Uh, we've had principal meetings and team meetings to literally take maps of the school as big as your table, define all of our spaces, uh, to really look at where our entry points will be and exits out of the building, where car riders will arrive, bus riders will arrive, where um, our isolation rooms will be, in some cases where one-way traffic will come down the hallway versus another, um, how school nutrition will deliver to classrooms versus cafeterias. So in short, the types of barriers, you might see plexiglass uh, dividing people, uh, specifically at the front office reception area. Uh, but in terms of individual barriers, the state has provided five uh, washable masks for all students and employees. Uh, however, Beaufort County Schools has also utilized some of our funding to purchase uh, PPE and other face wear masks and shields for our employees and children to be safe. Older teachers should be at greater risk. However, you have budgetary concerns and must be prepared to get the most you can get out of all the assets to be as successful as, as possible, and that includes the older teachers. Sure. How are you going to implement the use of them? going forward because they're just one of the tools in your tool chest to educate our children. Well, I think they're the tool. When you're talking about a teacher and teacher assistants, uh, there is no greater opportunity than that face-to-face -face instruction and working closely with children in my professional experience. But sincerely, uh, we're going to look at the protocols and guidelines to talk about social distancing. Uh, we're working with our employees individually and in groups. Over 85% of our employees say they want to come back based on the survey that we put out. Um, and then about 10% actually wrote back and said that they want to come back with maybe some type of accommodation, meaning that we need to help them in a little bit of a different way. And so I think it's really changing people's behaviors. It's also educating our adults in terms of what it means to work in these protocols in order to keep you safe. But honestly, as an employee, uh, you know, who may have diabetes, an underlying heart condition, who may have asthma, or whatever that concerns them individually, we take that very seriously and we try to work with them individually to make sure that if they prefer to come back into the classroom, that we're going to create space and distance between them and, and other students. But honestly, a large portion of that is going to be, you know, how often do you wash your hands, do you keep your mask on, do you put your face shield on? Um, you know, in certain circumstances, will they wear gloves? 
but what are your physical behaviors to ensure your own safety in these mechanisms in a similar way as if you're walking into a store or somewhere else. But we're going to respond to every employee to try to meet their needs and their concerns. And uh, I guess you're going to have some pretty strict practices that will have to be followed within the school properties. Yeah. And, and I would think those practices are uh, very contingent on behavior changes. For example, uh, when the governor mandated that we wear masks in, in public, well, that's a behavior change for people. Uh, the fact that you and I are six feet apart and you and I are not wear, wearing masks now, both you and I believe that we're in a safe zone. However, when we enter the school building, the governor said everyone, K-12 and all employees, will have a mask on at all times. So we're looking at opportunities that when individuals are beyond six feet, can we give them mask breaks? Can they take it off? Can they feel you know, a little breath of fresh air? Of course. Um, and also, how do our instructors do, you know, all instructors for that matter, how do they work with their children while wearing masks? But to your point, when you're looking at people um, who are a greater age, either you know, at mine or, or above, but also their individual health conditions, People are going to have to follow protocols in order to maintain their safety. And, and honestly, Stan, my job as a superintendent before anyone is educated is to try to put in all measures to ensure people's safety. And whether that's COVID-19, whether that's acts of violence, uh, no matter what that is, that's what my responsibility is first and foremost. So we're gonna to try to make sure all safety measures are there. And then if our employees and our students um, have behavior issues that they cannot follow those protocols, then we're going to have some individual encouragement. And then if it you know, still does not follow to that suit, then we'll have to make some other accommodations for them. It's kind of like uh, you're the general, the big guy, the four-star general, and you have your folks that work under you. There's a plan. The plan has got to be adhered to. Sure. Sure. Yeah, or everything falls apart. Well, what's really interesting about that is what boils down to is all those authentic relationships. And honestly, um, you know, we have really great leaders at our building, at our buildings. We have really great leaders inside of our schools. Absolutely love our principals and assistant principals. But I also have the same admiration for all of our employees. And I think our employees can police each other at times and say, hey, don't forget to grab your mask or hey, don't forget to put that on. Or as a reminder, we need to do this and don't forget to wash your hands. But I also think that comes back to a community who embrace one another um, and see each other as, as equals. So although my title is superintendent, and as you referenced, you know, the four-star general, um, I, I love to be viewed as a teammate in that regard. And I would hope that people would practice effectively in terms of their safety in order to ensure the safety of others. As you mentioned, this is kind of a new thing for a lot of people. Sure. It's very unique. I'm an older gentleman. I've never seen anything like this in all my days. Right. Never thought I would see this in America. And while I think some of it is a little bit hysterical, and we may be reaching herd immunity faster than we thought we would, I'm hearing some reports of that now. And while what we're seeing now in the southern United States may be the last hurrah for the virus, it won't come too soon, especially with a, there being a vaccine, possibly at the end of this year, the beginning of next year. However, we've got to do everything we can do that's proper and perfect right now, because nobody knows what the future will bring, ultimately. Right. It's like wearing the mask. If I come to your school, I'm going to wear a mask. I'm going to wear it because it's the proper and right thing to do, because I'm on your turf. When wow. I go to somebody else's place of business, yeah. whether they're wearing a mask or not, I'm going to wear the mask right. because it's polite. Right. As we speak of, of what is ethical and proper and, and polite sure. and how to operate amongst our, our students and our teachers and the public, what are you finding that is, is really difficult for children and teachers to adapt to? Well, first and foremost, I think it's summertime and the children are not with us right now. So what we're seeing is more reactions and responses from parents in our community telling us how this is impacting their children. Because they're not in our classrooms right now. They're at home, they're away, they're wherever they are. We do anticipate that 
there's a sense of wellness that we're really going to have to strive for. We're really going to have to focus on not just our students, but also our adults. How is this impacting people? And so let's talk about the adults for a moment. Uh, there are many of our workers who have spouses or partners or you know, others in their family who have lost jobs, who have been sick, who don't feel well. And those create stresses in life and those create anxiety moments. And so considering how do we really work to live and how do we really promote our employees where they can say, all right, between the hours of eight and five in this conversation, eight and five as an example, we're going to work and give it the best we can. But beyond that, we're going to focus on our family and what we need to do in order to be well. And then if you look at that from a student perspective, you know, parents drop their kids off to us and they expect to get them back better or in the same condition or better, right? So how do we make sure that our students are engaged throughout a, a typical school schedule, but they can still enjoy time with their families? Back in the springtime, it, it was just suddenly shut down and we just did not have noticed that it was coming on that particular Saturday. Uh, many felt as though it might be a week later. So we had a little bit of knowledge, but it was just absolutely shut down all of a sudden. Well, when that happens, our educators have the biggest hearts in North Carolina. So they would educate kids during the school day, but by chance, if your child couldn't make it during the day, well, then they would hop back on at night. And by chance, if the family couldn't speak with you during the day, well, then they would call you at night. We really saw our educators working 14, 15 hours a day in terms of engagement with families, in terms of preparation for the next day. So honestly, Stan, what I really think that we're gonna see is an increase in services of how we work with the wellness of our employees, the wellness of our students, and the wellness of our community. Meaning, how do we help people thrive and how do we help people cope all while we're trying to you know, do our core business of teaching and learning. So you're saying through all the stress that you're having to deal with, mm -hmm. you may have a better whole child, a better whole teacher, and a better unit going forward. That is your wish and your hope and your desire. What I'm hoping is that the world realizes that we can slow down a little bit and we can really critique, audit our practices. And these are moments where transformation occurs. New behaviors come out of this. And so how do we make new behaviors a commonplace in Beaufort County Schools where it's better for our employees, it's tremendously better for our children, and ultimately our families benefit from that too. The last thing any family wants for their child is to have a teacher in a room who's absolutely mentally exhausted. That's not good for anyone. And the last thing that we want to do is have any, of one, any one of our employees feel as though that we don't recognize them. So often I believe that in any conversation, if I'm speaking to you, do you understand the value I have for you? So when you walk away and think, I wonder if Matthew really listened to what I said, we want to make sure that's an authentic relationship and that both parties feel valued. So therefore, we want to make sure that our community members, our parents, our business leaders, our children feel valued. And on the back end of that, we want to make sure that all of our employees feel valued. The key part about it is when I walk into an environment and being a dad myself of a child who's in our school system, when I walk into that environment where other parents and families send their children to those environments of our schools every single day, I just often think to myself, if my child cannot be in that environment, and I really don't want any other children to be in the, that environment also. So we just really try to work with all of our teachers, our administrators, our Board of Education to create a dynamic. And some might say that I have maybe some lofty hopes and dreams, but why not dream it? And why not just really make that environment the best opportunity for children and adults? And I think a lot of times people forget that the adults inside the classrooms, the adults inside our school buildings, also have aspirations and dreams. And maybe it's a teacher who wants to become a principal or a principal who wants to become a superintendent or it might be a school, um, you know, school cafe assistant who wants to become a manager. People have aspirations and dreams professionally. 
or it may be some of our employees who just love what they do and don't want to ever change their job role, but have aspirations and dreams outside of the workplace in order to work to live 100%, 100% of the time. So Superintendent Cheeseman, this grand empathy of yours could be the glue to make this all come together and, and stick fast and work. And this, this conversation we've had today has worked well, and I appreciate you coming. Absolutely. It's been a great show, and I appreciate the public for coming and continuing to come to Boca County now and witness these informational programs that we'll be having once a week, rain or shine. Thank you very much, and thank you very much for coming. Thank you for having me. This has been fantastic. God bless you. Thank you.